Hello everyone and welcome to the Curious Mind podcast. My name is Gabriel Ellis, I'm a psychotherapist and Buddhist scholar, and in this podcast I take deep dives into complex psychological topics that affect our well-being in general. In this podcast special, I want to describe an outline of what I developed as Buddhism-based therapy. I started engaging in Buddhism when I was finishing my MA in psychology about 20 years ago, and since then I practiced Buddhism and meditation. In total, I've spent about two years in monasteries, meditation centers, and on retreats in Asia, Europe, and North America. My research finally culminated in a PhD thesis that I recently completed, where I investigated historical Buddhism in detail. During all these years, I knew that original Buddhism can make important contributions to psychology and psychotherapy, even though it is primarily a set of spiritual practices. The thing is, it is not easy to see the connections to psychology, and most attempts try to see the Buddhist texts as infallible sources of wisdom and want to disregard modern psychology completely, or other approaches are simplifying, taking single elements and build a psychology around it, like the recent mindfulness movement. More truthfully, we have to see the Buddhist texts as an ancient, only partly reliable source of wisdom because of transmission errors. Also, it belongs to a different time and a different cultural background. So it doesn't make sense to take a dogmatic religious stand and say, the Buddha said so-and-so, and apply it one-to-one -to, -one to people today. On the other hand, we have to acknowledge that one of the main developments of modern psychology is only implicitly found in Buddhism, namely the unconscious that has been investigated in depth psychology and hypnotherapy. Also, our improved understanding of how society affects the individual cannot explicitly be found in original Buddhism. Both the unconscious and social influence don't contradict the Buddhist approach. They rather sharpen our understanding of why certain Buddhist principles work at all. So in my journey of discovery and fusion of Buddhism and psychology, I had to develop a new approach to bring the two together. And what I did was to highlight the seven most important factors in Buddhism that contribute to and are responsible for self-development and psychological healing. These seven principles are based on Buddhism, but are not techniques in a narrow sense. Instead, they are necessary elements in all therapies, will support a healing process, and will make improvements that have been achieved more sustainable. Before I describe the seven principles more in detail, I'd like to highlight the goal of Buddhist practice, and derived from that, the goal of Buddhism-based therapy. The highest goals of Buddhism can best be described as liberation or freedom, which is the famous nirvana or nibbana. But just before the end goal of liberation, there's another intermediate goal, which is called samadhi. Samadhi is a fundamental unification and integration of the mind. I also like to call it a defragmentation in that it reverses the normal fragmentation of our mind, which results in a deep satisfaction and feelings of joy and well-being. Mental fragmentation is very normal, unfortunately, and somewhat necessary, but it is nonetheless very exhausting and stressful. It comes from all the different roles we have to perform and the different standards we want to achieve, especially if they are contradictory. We're supposed to be independent, but also socially committed. Or we are supposed to be very chill and relaxed, but at the same time energetic and high achievers, humble and confident, etc. To put it simply, fragmentation drives us nuts and exhausts us. We are not ourselves in this state. And this ultimately leads to feel disconnected, apathetic, aimless, depressed, and anxious. From this perspective, integration or defragmentation are essential to bring us back to ourselves again, to get in touch with who we are and develop an intuition that guides us through our life. And here I make the transfer to Buddhism-based therapy. Because 
while we don't achieve the highest integration of Samadhi, it still shines a light on how important integration and defragmentation are as goals for psychological well-being and self-development in general. And by that I mean the integration of our unconscious needs and desires with our conscious thinking, feeling and acting. The integration should encompass all important fields of life, relationships, regarding partnership, sexuality, family and friendships, livelihood, regarding career and money, or other fields of self-development in time. So the seven principles that I will describe now have exactly this goal, to integrate our unconscious and our lives, and thus to approximate the highest Buddhist goals in our normal day-to-day -day lives. Now to the seven principles. The first one is self-love or self-compassion. Self-love is an attitude of self-care and self-forgiveness and is basically the starting point of any wholesome journey. Without an intention to self-care, we cannot meaningfully start a development in Buddhism-based therapy. More practically, it means that we embrace our inner critic that we all have, forgive ourselves for the past, and do the right thing in the present so that we can set up our well-being for the future. After having done this as an extension, we compassionately support others in their own self-care and understand their struggles. When we apply this principle, no matter if we start with in-life or meditative kindness and compassion, pretty soon we reach our limits where our good intentions stop to be authentic and start to be fake and mechanical. And this is where it gets interesting, because here I have really the chance to understand and expand the fabric of my concept of what self-love or self-compassion is. The second principle is honest self-examination. We need this in order to ensure that we base our future decisions on proper information. Also, this is an important exercise in clarity and objectivity. People with an exaggerated positive self-ideal will overestimate their abilities or characteristics, which will lead to a clash with reality or with the perception of other people, to blame shifting and isolation. On the other hand, depressed or anxious people will underestimate or denigrate themselves, which leads to unfulfilled needs and desires. Both of these groups also, as a consequence of their unrealistic view on themselves, usually wrongly assess the people around them, either idealizing or disparaging them. Obviously, honest self-examination also stabilizes self-love, because the more realistically I see myself, the more resonant self-love will be for the unconscious. The third principle is taking ownership for our life and our experience. It is of course widely known and plausible that taking ownership of our life activates us and makes us pursue our goals. A Buddhist psychological approach goes some steps further in that we not only take ownership for our actions and feelings, but for the whole cognitive change of experiencing as well. Looking closely, already our perceptions are guided by our intentions, and our intentions are formed by our past and our unconscious needs. The philosopher Schopenhauer famously wrote that we might do what we want, but we cannot want what we want. But this is exactly where a Buddhist perspective sets in. We carefully engage with our desires, embrace them, but then also challenge them. It's not that we attempt to change our desires out of petty motivation for success or self-mastery. We rather develop a holistic view of ourselves and our lives and are thus able to let our desire change. Then, in coordination with our unconscious, we let new desires arise, which are wholesome for us in an integrated, bigger picture. The next principle is curiosity and openness. 
This is important for a very specific reason, namely that the mental space that is best suitable for self-development is curiosity, openness, playful investigation. If I'm fixed on a specific outcome or fixed on a specific view of my issues, then I will most probably remain stuck in the very patterns which led me to my problems in the first place. Here I often encounter a phenomenon that I termed the solutions of the past became the problems of the present. What I mean with that is that we typically develop some solution in a difficult situation and then indiscriminately carry it into the future. For example, if in school I learned to be assertive and aggressive in order to be heard, or if in a violent household the solution was to become invisible, then this is stored in the unconscious as a successful strategy. And even when the life circumstances change dramatically and need a different attitude, I still continue as my go-to strategy to be assertive or invisible in these two examples. These old strategies are then rooted in my personality in many subtle ways. And in order to change them, I need to have an attitude towards this unknown that is inquisitive. Otherwise, I will find only the crude and not the subtle ones. This open attitude towards the unknown is also necessary in order to discover any new mental space at all. Otherwise, I will end up chasing again solutions from the past, which have worked to some extent or another. The fifth principle is energetic peace. Sometimes people misunderstand the development of Buddhist peace as a kind of motionless, apathetic lethargy. This can hardly be our ideal. The whole point of our mental capabilities is to enable us to respond accurately to life situations and to fulfill our needs in a wholesome, meaningful way. But this is only possible if we have a way to deal with uncertainty and the unpleasant events in life. The traditional tool to develop such a calm, energetic mind is formal meditation. But there are many other approaches and contemplations within the Buddhist framework to develop it. For example, the so-called perception of impermanence can be applied to all life situations, if it is properly used and not only in formal sitting meditation. The next principle is to keep in mind conditionality. Now, this is a quite sophisticated, complex topic, and whoever wants to do more Buddhist research can start with looking for the so-called doctrine of dependent origination. For the purpose of Buddhism-based therapy, we don't have to go into the abstract depth of the topic. What is just important to keep in mind is that no mental phenomenon is static. That means that if a mental state, like anger or love, seems stable, the state is actively and repeatedly renewed. In a way, we know this phenomenon well. When we say, for example, I'm angry that I was not promoted. The actual mental process is that again and again, the memory comes up that I was not promoted, which then triggers the emotion of not being treated fairly, which leads to the emotion of anger. But again, this reminding oneself has to happen so that it results in anger. And if the reminding occurs often enough during a day, then I can truly say that I was angry the whole day. The same mechanisms works for positive emotions as well. Moods are trickier though, because they are often not triggered by conscious reminders, but rather by unconscious ones. So here we need more careful investigation if we want to find out where a mood is coming from. It is, however, not always necessary to find the biographical reasons behind reminders because, again, the reminding happens in the present. So an important part of changing dysfunctional moods or an inflexible personality is to find out how the mood, emotion or personality aspect is recreated in the present. And then, rather than changing something dramatically, I simply have to stop recreating the negative state. 
The final principle is individuality. People usually don't know that the original monastics around the historical Buddha were forest dwellers who lived either alone or in small groups up to five people outside of society. They abandoned the rules, conventions and customs of society and adopted an originally simple code of conduct of ascetic loners who met only every 14 days for communal rituals. Now this lifestyle certainly had many reasons, mainly to enable the monastics to focus on their spiritual practice. But it had the important side effect that it deconditioned the ascetics from the scripts and the discourses of society. In the 20th century, psychology and psychotherapy rediscovered how essentially the mind develops under the influence of the social rules and language-based scripts of the parents, the family, the tribe, and of society as a whole, on the expectations, demands, and blueprints. As necessary as these are in the beginning, they are also very much contradicting each other. At the same time, we are supposed to be nice and competitive, humble and confident, relaxed and ambitious, hedonistic and self-controlled, etc., etc. So under these circumstances, if we simply try to fulfill the demands of family, tribe and society, we will never be whole and integrated. Instead, we end up fragmented, drained and exhausted, fighting for one goal and sabotaging ourselves just in the next situation. Ultimately, if we want to be integrated, we have to replace society's rules, beliefs and scripts with our own. And in order to do that, we have to fundamentally question who we are and how we really want to be, which desires we want to support and which not. To find life satisfaction as an integrated whole person is certainly the most demanding tasks of all. And for that process, we need the support of all the previous principles, self-love, honest self-examination, ownership, curiosity, energetic peace and conditionality. This was a glimpse into the foundations of what I developed as Buddhism-based therapy, and I will continue to detail more aspects and applications in future articles, and hopefully soon enough also a book project. Stay tuned and let me know your specific questions so that I can include them in my next works. Thanks for listening.